You gave me uh, my first and only Quran. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. It must have been so long ago. It was, yeah, it was beautiful. And I've read it. Well, I um, see you're still Christian, so it didn't really work. <laughs> God have mercy on us. Did I screw that up? And you can get Listen Up for only 14 Our friends uh, from redrockroasters.com uh, are roasters out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they have just sent us some amazing coffee. Tasted it earlier today. Cannot wait to get home. And, uh, rich coffee. It's good. You brew this, this bad boy up. So thank you so much. Well, um, as we kind of get into, the, the, I mean, uh, with you, it's always feels like the conversation's already, you know, so rich. And I, I'm, I met you, Shark, uh, I forget how long ago. It's been maybe 10 years, 2000. Uh, what to say we were connected through Charles? Charles wrote Trammell at uh, Revision. Right. And I was, I think at that point, I think it was 2013 or 15 or something, I had just moved back from mm. from England, I think, and was working. Wow, you were in England. Mm, for a little while. Um, but, My but the com- calendar doesn't go that far. <laughs> I was trying to say, when, when, did we have, when did we have that last yeah. podcast? Yeah, it was, but I remember it. Like, I remember what we discussed. I remember... I remember some of the conversations that we had in the middle of that, and I remember thinking, I have a ton to learn from you, um, just about faith, about the way you move in the world, um, about the way you love God, you understand your own religion, but are also really porously open to, uh, you know, uh, folks like me, and uh and then you were, um, I, then I saw you on every panel where they need, you know, um, some religious leader in the community. <laughs> you are, you know, I so saw you yeah. start to be, you know, in conversation with, you know, different folks in different places and just gain more and more respect from you. And then just recently being on that committee with, uh, at the Rothko Chapel. Oh, that's right. And being able to sit across from you and have dinner. And just share. So that was a nice group. Yeah, really, really. Want tell us, tell me just a little bit about yourself and your story, and what what brought you to this chair today. <laughs> I'm born and raised in Fort Bend, and um, was a product of first generation Pakistani immigrants. My dad got here in '71. My mom got here in '79, wow. and I'm the first born, so I was the experiment. Right, and that's the story of many immigrant families. It doesn't have to be South Asian; it could be Hispanic, it could be Italian, mm-hmm. Japanese. Any first immigrants come here. The firstborn is usually the experiment because there's always a wanting to preserve the culture and oh. the identity okay. versus the clash with the new American identity, which inevitably always wins over because it's much more fun, it's cooler, it's relevant, and it's there. And it's not right? your parents. <laughs> yeah, and it's not your parents, right? So one way of rebelling against your parents was always having a stronger adaptation of the American identity. And so just grew up in that culture or that crisis of identity, um, like a lot of other second generation kids do. Um, But mine was more prevalent because I was a double minority. Not only was I not Christian, but I was also brown. And an unusual type of brown, because the browns are usually the Central Americans, the North Americans. Um, But I was, I remember telling, People are asking, where is Pakistan? I'd have to say it's next to India, right? I yeah. say, oh, what does that mean? You're a vegetarian. It's like, no, we're very carnivorous. But 9 you must 11. love America. Yeah, but then, but then 9 that 11 near Oklahoma? changed all that. Yeah. That's just North Oklahoma, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. Pakistan. <laughs> but then 9 11 changed all that, right? Yeah, right. Now right. everyone knew where Pakistan was. People, mm. our president was pronouncing Pakistan like Pakistan, not Pakistan. Mm. And so things things changed when the world shifted, right? Mm. So I, I I went to I went to U of H, um, went to UT, went to many schools. My background was I just wanted to do entrepreneurship. I got a degree so I could get married. In my culture, you have to have a degree in order to get married to be uh. legitimate. So I took the seven or eight year plan, I don't yeah, know, to yeah. get a degree. And I got a degree in something that I love, which is history, okay. something that I could enjoy because I was always doing business. But at the same time, I was um, running, I started uh, a youth organization in Houston called Crescent Youth. Yes. Right? It was uh, 
just essentially it started off as a Muslim organization to help kids battle that identity crisis that I and so many others went through to be like sort of like the big brother, big sister. Like mm-hmm. you don't, you're going to go through ABC, your parents are going to say this, this is how you keep your mouth shut and continue on, <laughs> right? This is how you stay out of trouble. These are yes. things that you can do. And, and, you know, you said something earlier about policing the borders, right? Yeah. That's how a lot of Muslims, especially myself, grew up like, this is right, this is wrong. Yeah. This is, you know, religion is about sin, mm. right? It's about rules. It's a set yes. of rules, a set of engagement policies. Um, and you can't stray outside, otherwise you will earn God's mm. wrath. Um, that's the way a lot of Muslims grew up too. Too many still to this day, a lot of Muslims grew up like that. So, so the organization was about forging and in many ways foraging an American Muslim identity. Yes. For kids. Can you, th- th- that was an insight that you helped me with that unlocked like this like new world for me yeah. in that, and I'm, I'll say what I heard you say sure. in, in a conversation, and please correct me. Um, but that a lot of what what we see is not necessarily the 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 beautiful inner workings of um, of Islam, but it really is a cultural adaptations, or it it like any religion brings a culture with it. And so often, what we're seeing is from around the world. Yeah cultures that are coming together clashing with other cultures and we're calling that islam that's right that's right but that's the story of all immigrant identity groups Mm -hmm. i mean if we talk to lutherans um from before it was the elca you had lutherans from nordic countries and then germanic countries and then catholic countries who are lutherans or lutherans who come from catholic bring their own version of lutheranism yeah right to the united Uh, states uh, Right, and then you've got the Lutherans that are on Minnesota, yeah. and then you have the Lutherans in Nebraska, yeah. and there's shades of differences, yeah. right? Just shades yeah. of difference. But when they come to Houston because they're attracted to the oil and gas industry here, and you see those differences manifest in the church, mm-hmm. and then you have splits, and then you have divisions, and now you've got the ELCA and the Missouri Synod. I'm completely simplifying this, but there's there's differences in how you view theological texts based upon cultural mindset yes. and it's the same thing with muslims it happened oh. with the jews right you've got the jews from ukraine you've got the jews yes. from germany the jews yeah. from you know the sephardic jews they all have different understandings right, yes. of the same text yes and it's not black and white understandings it's just different shades of gray yeah right um the muslim community is the same thing it's you have muslims who've come from saudi you've got muslims that have come from pakistan and india the subcontinent muslims that have come from malaysia and even africa Right, which was one of the the hotbed of Islamic civilization at one point in Africa. We have the most Nigerians in Houston outside yes. of Nigeria, right? Um, Hakim Olajuwon, and so you, you you have different cultural mindsets when it comes to how Islam should be practiced mm. in the United States or even just in Houston. But those mindsets are slowly taking a back seat. To this, to this creation of the American Muslim identity. Mm-hmm. As Nigerian second generation Muslim Americans marry Pakistani, uh, Pakistani American Muslims, and then we've got this inter-ethnic marriage and cultural yes. melting pot, or just hanging out. You see, my, my parents are from Pakistan. They didn't hang out with Nigerians in Karachi. Right? They didn't hang out with Malaysians in Karachi. They never hung out with Indians. In Karachi. in Karachi, right? Talk about that's worse like, than hanging out with. Like it was that's worse than hanging out with anyone else. Absolutely, yeah. right? Okay. And that, but that's how I have worked with Nigerians, mm. Saudis, you know, Emiratis, and others. It's a it's the same concept. You didn't really hang out with people from far and distant mm. cultures, but here we have to hang out with people. Our mosques are a complete melting pot. It's a true representation of the United States. Yes, right. Um, I live just down the street from a. Really large mosque in us uh, in Spring Branch mm, and El Farouk. Uh, yes, and it's it's beautiful. Um, and during, May, particularly on Fridays, prayers, it is a traffic jam. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a there's a lot across the uh, across the street yeah. from uh, uh, from the mosque, and and I've been there where I'm caught in traffic, stopped, and people are coming across, and it is like. The phrase in, in, in out of our text, every tribe 
and every nation yeah, that's <laughs> is right. moving Everyone's. across the street to go pray. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. It's cool. It's yes. like, a, and every Friday at El Farouk Islamic Center is like an Astros game. People are coming from all over <laughs> and they're jamming up traffic. They're parking on top of one another yes. and they're trying to park on that curve. Yes. Look around. No <laughs> cops are there. All right, <laughs> let me go. dart in real quick. You know, make it, who's going to tell me when I'm praying? Yes. Right. <laughs> but that's, that's so many Islamic centers. That's great. Right. Yeah. That's because we're, we're going through our growing pains as well. You know, we built out Islamic centers during COVID when, when so many faith centers were shutting down, we increased the number of faith centers we had during COVID it's just uh-huh. because there's such a huge population boom. But what's beautiful is that population boom isn't coming from just one or two places. It's coming from all over the world. Yes. Right. And now we have a population boom coming from Afghan refugees, and then maybe we'll have more of Hazan refugees. And then we have uh, people coming from Myanmar, um, you know, Rohingya. And so you've got the refugee population coming in, but then you also have the traditional immigrant population coming mm-hmm. in as well. Mm-hmm. How is that? What does that do or how does that affect the Muslim community here? And does it affect faith or the the outworking of a community when there's an influx? And, um, you know, and, and I would imagine that one of the things that is core to your faith is hospitality. I'm, in fact, I would love to hear, oh, yeah. like, could we, could we, before we go there, could we just, could you just talk about kind of the core of your faith and, and, and yeah, just give us a, give us a tour. Look, to be, to be Muslim means the, the, the word Muslim, the word Islam essentially means to submit to the will of God. Okay. Right. It means submission to the will of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and that submission to the will of God happens through in Islam, through what's laid out for us in the Quran, okay. right? Our holy book and through the Sunnah, which is the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Our Christian friends would say the teachings of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have been transcribed to generation after generation after generation. And so we look to both the Quran and the way that the Prophet Muhammad carried that out. Mm -hmm. And what are the core tenets? So so there's five pillars of Islam. Okay. There's five pillars that really really say, yeah, you're a Muslim or... um, These are just, this is just the bare minimum that you have to do. Okay. And... The, the first one is the Shahada, which is the testimony of faith. That's the pillar upon which everything else relies on, the foundation. You could do every sin in the book, but as long as you repent, or not even as long as you repent, as long as you believe that God is one, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the last and final messenger, you're a Muslim. By identity, you're a Muslim. You could be drinking alcohol. You could be drinking a, you know, a Jack Daniels in the morning and having all the bacon that you want and your BLTs <laughs> at nighttime, not praying a day. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe even doing some other stuff that could be a little loosey-goosey. But as long as you believe that God is one and that Muhammad is the last and final messenger, you're a Muslim. So that's the core essential. After that comes prayer. We pray five times a day. After that comes fasting. We fast 29 to 30 days a year, and we just came out of yeah, Ramadan. Ramadan. The fourth <laughs> one is um, is giving in charity, right? Giving alms. Mm. Uh, that's mandatory. As a Muslim, you have to give in charity. And the fifth is doing a pilgrimage once in your lifetime if you're able to, which is the Hajj, which is in America. It was made really popular by Malcolm X. Yes. Right? And so those are that's the core essential. But when you look at when you look at sort of the spiritual pillars of mm-hmm. Islam as well, you know, a part of that is having mercy, of having being warm and welcoming. There's a there's a part of the Sunnah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, one of one of the th- couple of things that he said was even a smile is a form of charity. Mm. Right, that's beautiful. Even a smile, like we're rewarded for smiling because <laughs> because it invites people in. It creates a welcoming environment. Yeah. A smile is more than just a smile. It allows you to ask me my name. A smile allows you to say, "Hey, how are you doing?" A smile allows you to be a neighbor, mm. right? And speaking of neighbors, another principle mm. is that you are not a believer if your neighbor goes hungry, right? It's so cool. It's so profound that forces us to talk to our neighbors. Whether we do it or not is a whole different question. Mm -hmm. It forces us to care for our neighbors, to ask them their names, right? Because you don't just go up to someone and say, hey, are you hungry? Do you have food on your table? 
you get to know them. Mm -hmm. You understand them. You know their kids' names. You yes. know their likes, their yes. dislikes, because it allows them to open up to you. You know if they have food on their table because you know if they have a job or if they're struggling or not, but you don't you know any of that. If you don't even know their name. Mm. Right. That's right. Hunger, anxiety, fear always has a name, doesn't it? That's right. And there's something about not like to depersonalize that as an issue dehumanizes us all. Oh, absolutely. And so when it comes to these new refugees that are coming in, mm. I mean, if you'd asked me 20, 20 years ago if I've ever had ate at an Afghan restaurant, I'd say there's not one in Houston. <laughs> but with all the Afghans that are here, man, Afghani food is so delicious. Yeah, I think you it took is so it. Is good. You, we ate. Is it? I, we, 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 we met up. It was when my wife, it was this summer when uh, my wife's car broke down. We were midway through a meal and it was delicious. Oh, and I forget where. Maybe I usually take, on a first date, I usually take people to a Pakistani restaurant. Okay, maybe it was a So it's probably a Pakistani it was, restaurant. Uh, it was. It was yeah. phenomenal. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm sure it was. <laughs> but Afghan food is also great. And now with the mm. uh, refugees, the Rohingya coming in, I'm looking forward to having Rohingya food uh, in the next couple of um, the next couple of years, and then mm. more Palestinian food. And it's, it's re when refugees come, um, they bring along with their cultural traditions. They also bring along with their their religious identity yes. as well, but it it blends in, it creates such a beautiful cultural fusion. Not at once. Yes. It takes a little while because <clears throat> they have to adapt to our way of life. Everyone has to adapt to mm. our way of life, right? Yeah. Um, they're learning to be American. They're understanding what works, what doesn't work. Um, and then they gain that entrepreneurial spirit and get me some <laughs> Afghan food. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talk a bit about like that, um, the contours or the maybe the the some of the the guts of what it means to be an American Muslim, like right is is as not as opposed to, but so you have you have folks from from Afghanistan coming, or, yeah, um, you know, all over the world, right, and they're confronted, like you had said, with a culture, and it takes time. Yeah. What is what is that? Like and so they've been fully assimilated into the, you know, Muslim culture that is American. Say maybe sure. even from your youth group that you were, sure. um, you were nurturing. What does that look like then? Like what's the what do you have to lay down or sense or confront or let go of? What do you have to adopt? It's a sense of freedom. Mm. It's a sense of freedom, and and this is going to sound so American of me. But the American version of Islam is probably the most accurate version of Islam. And I'll tell you Talk why. Talk about that. Yeah. I'll tell you why. American Islam is definitely exceptionalism at its finest because we are not bound by one or two or three specific cultures. Okay. We're not bound by a sense of questioning anything mm -hmm. or any part of your religion can be considered blasphemous or heretic. Um, we're not bound by anyone's specific viewpoint because they're the imam of this neighborhood or of this mosque, so we must all follow what this individual says, okay. like it is in other parts of the world, in right. many, many, many parts of the world. As Americans, we're taught to say why. We question everything. Yes. We question God's existence yes. without fear of repercussion. Yes. We question our pastor, our imam, Come our on. rabbi without fear of any repercussion. I mean, it may not look good, <laughs> right? It may not look, <laughs> no, especially no. nowadays with social it's media, it might be good. Yeah. yeah. But we can do we it. Can we do. won't get thrown in jail. We won't be outcast you by be the whole out community. Of the mosque if right. you're like, hey. Okay. Exactly. And and we're taught and be, because of all this and because oh, we're sort of a minority in a foreign land, our parents have had a sense of maintaining their cultural and the religious identity. Mm -hmm. So we're taught the Quran from an early age. We're taught the translation from an early age. And so because of that, we're able to really start to say, what is culture? What is actually Islam? So the extra additional practices, sort of the, the cream and the additional sauces that were put on top that have been layered and layered and layered over time now makes the brisket taste horrible yes. where you didn't need anything. Yes. You just needed a good rub, right? <laughs> Salt and pepper, which is like the Quran and yeah. the Sunnah. That's all we needed. <laughs> we didn't need any of this A1 steak sauce. We didn't need any you know habanero sauce. We didn't need any of this stuff on our brisket. And... As, as American Muslims, we're able to, because we're away from Pakistan and Saudi and Egypt, we can say, wait, 
we don't we don't want the A1. We're happy with the salt and pepper because it's simple, it's easy, yeah. and it's without restrictions. Mm. We can practice Islam here to the fullest, which is part of the reason why Ooh. the largest export of the Muslim community in the United States is American Muslim identity. That's the largest export. One of the largest exports. That's right. And here's why. Because our imams and our scholars here are viewed in the hundreds of millions on YouTube, on, uh, on podcasts, throughout the United Kingdom, throughout Europe, throughout the Middle East, throughout South Asia. The imams and the scholars who are American-born are traveling the world talking about Islam. There used to be a time where our communities were importing imams from yes. Saudi and yes. Egypt and Malaysia and Pakistan to come here, tell us, teach us about the when religion. When you and I were kids, that was That's the, exactly yeah. how it was done, yes. right? But now uh, our imams and scholars are in demand around the world to come teach this type of Islam because it's an Islam free of anyone's culture, anyone's cultural interpretation that has been formed by tribalism or colonialism or the need for survival or the need to do something extra over yes. the years. Over here in America, we've had to take everything down to the foundations. We stripped come everything on. down to the foundations because you have these Egyptian Muslims, the Pakistani Muslims, the Saudi Muslims, they all come with their you know, they're, they stuff. all come with their, you know, their, their steak sauces, right? Or all their sauces. And quickly realize that this doesn't taste good at all. So let's go down in the meat of it. Okay. Let's get right down to the basic. What is actually what? And right. that, that ability to question is not heard of in other parts of the world. It's very unique to the American experience. Mm. Not even the British experience. <clears throat> the British, they imported entire villages into Birmingham or Leeds, yes. entire villages moved over there, yes. right? And so they brought that tribalism with them and they've maintained that tribalism even to this day. Yes. But here, our immigration patterns have been entirely different. All right, we've come from education, we've come from wealth. We hadn't, hadn't, until recently, we hadn't had to flee any kind of destruction or violence. We came here to be well off, to live the American dream. That's allowed us to explore and create this American Muslim identity, which is so beautiful. You know, the, one of the largest universities in the, in, in the world is based out of Houston. It's called Al Maghrib Institute. Okay. Right? So it's a weekend seminar type university. They do a four year degree, um, but they have students all over the world in the tens of thousands, right? All in the majority. No, they, do, they have American scholars travel all over the world Wow. To teach these courses, American scholars. And that's just one institute. And is it, what do you study at that school? You can study Sharia law, okay. which is the framework to understand Islamic law, okay. which is how do you get married? How do you get divorced? You know, what is the, what is the issue with inheritance laws, financial laws? Okay. Um, you could study different things such as general theology. You can study aspects of uh, general jurisprudence. There's so many different degree pathways. Okay. Would, right. in, in, the con, in, in the context that um, I come out of, would that be uh, a theological Education is that what that, it, it would okay. be? It would allow you to become a chaplain okay. or an imam. But to to be clear, in Islam, you don't need a degree or any kind of study to become an imam. You could do it the Joel Osteen way and say, "My dad was a pastor. I'm a pastor." Right? Well, am I, I don't know if I should say that. That's your good, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we can just knight you as a pastor right now, right? <laughs> just print some cards up, and there you go. So you can you can do that way in, in Islam because there's no credentialing system right. to be a part of the cloth, right? Um, but this allows some level of credibility and a foundation mm. for knowledge, which allows for people to get, I mean, we have an imam in Houston who's very, very popular, Imam Amar, who's, whose degree is from the Al Maghrib Institute, right? Okay. It's Where's amazing. he from? He is Sudanese, Okay. but born American. He's from, so he's from Queens. From New York? Yeah, he's from New York. Okay. Yeah. What, what part of Houston is he in? He is in the Clear Lake area. Okay. What makes him popular? Yeah. I, he's really, he's a poet. Okay. He speaks very well. He's young. Um, he's American. Um, and he has a, a true, true grasp of how to relay Islam to an American Muslim audience, mm. right? Which is really nice. Yeah. Um, he's got a very large group of uh, young professionals that follow him, um, that go to his, that go to his seminars. 
Um, it helps that his father-in-law is one of the premier North American scholars as well, okay. uh, which is really cool. Um, so that so. is the Joel Osteen connection. Right yeah, there. so that is the Joel Osteen connection in a way. Yeah, that's right. That's right. No, he's a, he's a great guy. In fact, he's going to be here at Chapelwood doing a seminar for us. When? Um, we're, we're looking at May 1st, uh, but I think we're going we're gonna to push it off to June. Okay. Um, because... Pastor Mike is going to be traveling most of, okay. um, or Rev Mike, Reverend, right? Michael, yeah. 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 He's going to be traveling all throughout May. Uh, but it's a program called Angels and Messengers where we explore our differences rather than mm. our similarities. Mm. The That's differences great. is where they get us. What do you mean? It's, it's, never the, it's never the similarities. It's like you and I like Christ, right? You, we both love Christ. Mm -hmm. I have an adoration for him. Um, the way he was born. Um, those are things that we hold common, but where they get us at is our differences and how we view social issues sometimes, or how we view cultural issues, or even some theological issues. So between Christians and Jews is who killed Christ, right? Mm. And they drive that wedge. Yeah, us, right. Right, and so they find our differences to wedge, because we all know that we have more in common than we don't, even with atheists, even with right. agnostics, right? Yes. We love our families, we want a shelter, you know, we want food on the table, everything that makes us human. It's, we, and, and, that, that, and we don't even need religion for that, it's just mm. what makes us human. Yes. We have so much in common. So and much. then when you add the theological labor, we have even more in common than right. our differences are so minute. I think what diverges the story of Muslims and Christians is primarily the story of the cross, right? In my opinion, in the opinion of many, it's, it's what happened to Jesus, right? We believe he still lives to this day, possibly one of the oldest living, in our perspective, human beings, right? And, and our friends in the Christian church believe that he died on the cross, right? Um, and much so much more after that as well. Um, if you talk to us about how we love our neighbors, how we love our families, it's the exact same. It, it's funny to me, and <clears throat> I hope maybe my bishop does not listen to this. <laughs> it's funny to me that um, what divides us in the end of the day is the impossibilities that are possible, right? So when, I, when you say what is the difference between maybe our differences is we believe that Christ is still living. Yeah. And a Christian might say, well, we do too. We just think there's a hiccup along the way. That's right. You know? but, um, but, but then the impossible possibility of both of those, right, um, seems to hold something that, is, um, that requires um, a type of um, leap of, in a Kierkegaardian term, faith, right. risk towards something that then um, is is a risk, right? It's a risk, what I believe. Um, and to, I feel like partly what, um, at least part of the growing edge of Christianity, is to continue to hold open to mystery and not to nail down, so to speak, these ideas that are impossible possibilities and then di as divisions, right? Like I hold these things as mystery. God is mystery at the end of the day. There's the mystery of God showing up on the planet, sure, right, um, is is a it's an absolute mystery, right. Um, if the core of all of that teaching from my faith tradition comes down to what um, um, one of the writers in the New Testament and in John says, this is the essential message that you have received from us: that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And then John goes on to say, and God is love, right? And so you're using these metaphors, these beautiful, rich, poetic metaphors that are about the light of life and love. Right. And then somehow we wield those as instruments of violence against each other instead of what you were saying earlier, you're my neighbor. I need to know your name. Are you hungry? I'd like to know your story, <laughs> which, no, is like, which I think that like, like um, both your prophet and mine might sit at a table and I might walk by a restaurant and they're laughing together. Oh my God. Because they're just like, you know. That is a picture. Right? Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon them both. If they were just hanging out, 
at a, I don't know, just any kind of restaurant having sandwiches, what would those sandwiches be? <laughs> but what would they be talking about? Yeah, and I see them laughing together, sharing a joke. Like, there's something about laughter that kind of both, like, undoes us and that opens us up, and it's kind of like, oh, and then we can kind of slide into some deeper stuff. Yeah, and then we insert Moses in there. He, he comes in, he shows up late, 15, right. 20 minutes yeah, late. The right. skeptic walks in with his, with his cane and just sets everyone right and says, you guys are doing this, this, this yeah. wrong. And then they all just share it. I was like, oh, Moses. That's so funny. <laughs> you, know, you, um, you gave me uh, my first and only Quran. Oh, is that right? Uh-huh. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. It must have been so long ago. It was, yeah, it was beautiful. And I've read it. Well, I um, see you're still Christian, so it didn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> Just barely. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that's so interesting to me is within our, within our, we, have, we share all this common story, right? Common actors within yeah. the story. Oh, yeah. Um, and it wasn't until I, you helped me with this. It was like talking about like um, Abraham and Isaac, right? And and Mount Moriah. And who was offered on the altar? Who was right? That? Right? Right? For us, it was Ishmael, right? For you, right. it was Isaac, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Abraham so, was tested twice. Yes. Yeah. And I think I the the I think the insight I had with you that has been juicy for me for ten years is wondering that like at the end of the of this story of of Abraham um, in the Hebrew tradition uh, text that he's promised land seed and blessing a land that uh, um, uh, there, there will be descendants that will number the stars of the sky right. Right and blessing for all nations, right is 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 what is promised at the end. At the end of his life, the only land he has and owns is a tomb for his wife Sarah, that he had to finagle off of a shady deal, <laughs> and he has two sons. That um, changed the world. Yes, and I began to wonder at that time. You um, and then um, after he he in the Hebrew scriptures after he um, buries Sarah, um, he marries Hagar mm-hmm. and is reunited with Hagar and and Ishmael. And at the end of Abraham's life, you at least the picture I have is two of their his boys um, burying their father in a tomb. And holding hands as they weep together for their father, who's who has loved them the best right. that a father could, and they're grieving. And I keep thinking that maybe our path forward, as Isaac and Ishmael, is holding each other's hand in the face of unspeakable grief of what we do with each other over ideas. And maybe we hold more in common, like you said, than we do in opposite. Maybe there's something about grief that brings us together in a way that being right doesn't. I mean, Harvey brought us together. Yeah, Ike brought yeah. us together. Uri brought us together. It's always the 9-11 brought us together. Yeah. In many ways, it tore us apart, but it inevitably brought us together. Mm. So many things bring us together, but that togetherness is so temporary. Yeah, yeah, and fragile. It's so temporary, very fragile, very fragile. And then we go off to the happy times, and then we forget mm. the beauty that we shared together. So part of the work that you're doing in Houston, I find to be like eminently fascinating and important in the Menorah Foundation. Could you talk a bit about that and about why that seems to be part of holding together the fragileness of our existence in a really creative, beautiful way, I think is important. When, when we started Minaret Foundation, it was about just the dialogue component. Mm-hmm. We just have to talk to each other more often. Who's we? Who's, just, who's the we? It, you, Muslims, Christians, okay. Jews specifically, because okay. it's not the Hindus that are going to bring out the swords and the axes, <laughs> not the Sikhs for sure, even it's though they used to walk around with daggers. <laughs> but no, it's, it's the Muslims, Jews, and the Christians who have always been at each other's throats mm-hmm. here you know, historically here in in Houston, we just want to talk about Houston. So we have the most tense relationships. So for 
for me, it was about how do we get each other to talk more often and more deliberately. You could have a hundred minaret foundations in the city and it won't be enough. There's so many faith centers, so many faith communities, so many people that need to talk to one another and we're so behind Yes, on talking to one another. And we just, I mean, your listeners just have to ask themselves, do they know their neighbors on the left and the right and the front and the back? Do they know their names and their kids' names? That's it, bare minimum. Their names and their kids' names. Do they do they know just that? In the four directions of their home. It's just in the four just in the four directions of <laughs> just their home. There. Just there. And just four <laughs> homes. That's it. Just four homes. And I think the majority mm-hmm. answer will always be no. Right. We've got so much work to do. Um, so our focus was just trying to pair up congregations, getting the Muslims to come outside of their bubble because you know, what folks don't realize is that Muslim activism, Muslim advocacy, Muslim relationships are just as old as 9, 12, 2001. Before that, the focus of the Muslim community was build, build, build. Build the mosques, build the cemeteries, build the slaughterhouses, build the schools um, so we could thrive as a community. The idea of going outside of our mosques and our schools to talk to Christians and Jews, mm. explore interfaith solidarity, or even what it means to be a Christian and uh, teach people what it means to be a Muslim was not a priority. It was yes. definitely there. It just wasn't a priority. But when the Twin Towers fell, it became, oh my God, these people have no idea who we are. No. Bin Laden is defining Islam, right? Al-Qaeda is defining Islam. We have to define Islam for ourselves and let the country know. And so a lot of these new organizations, a lot of these organizations that came out were born on 9, 12, 2001. Mm. Um, ours was born 2010, several years later, but the focus has always been building these relationships. So we built relationships year after year after year after year. And it came to a time of, okay, you've built the relationships. We have a lot of relationships in the city, <clears throat> but what are we gonna do with them? Yes, We've gotta do something, let's move towards because there's been a lot of conversations and relationships take years to curate. There's no doubt about that. You mm-hmm. can't just have coffee with someone and expect to just hold hands and they'll stand with you in the good times and the bad times. But you need to be, you know, there's something about crossing the flood in Harvey to go to your neighbor's house and give them a few bottles of water that really brought neighbors together. Just yeah. a sense of everyone checking on everyone, but it was a common sense of purpose. It was mission, survive. Yes. What was our mission? Our mission was to survive Harvey, to get through it, right? Um, what's our mission as a faith community other than just talking to one another and hoping that we can be neighbors? And so for us, it was, what's the next step? And for us, the next step was, well, you know, some organizations, some communities like to go and build a home for Habitat for Humanity. Humanity, that's like a two, uh, two day thing over a weekend peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, two hours. That's not going to build long lasting relationships. So what we're looking is how can we deepen and widen those relationships? That's a part of it. But how do we truly deepen and widen it? You know, when you have an imam, a rabbi and a pastor walking through the Texas Capitol building, um, that is a uh, three hour drive there and a three hour drive back. And that is months of educating our legislators when we're doing something at City Hall. That is months of working together, of congregations working together for a common mission, right? And that common mission for Minaret Foundation is usually to do with our children, child welfare, to do something about hunger, food insecurity, or to do something to ensure that we can all practice freely, religious freedom, Mm. right? So when we work together to quite literally, systemically, change the world around us. It really brings us together in a way because now we have battle stories. You remember when we went to so-and-so legislator and he was so surprised when we walked in, we said this and that, and then we had to go to another legislator and talk to them. And all the while myself and our staff are just pushing them along, telling them what to say, what yeah. not to say, how to <laughs> act. And then they get the hang of it pretty quick. But just, you know, there's something different about Um, Muslims, Jews, and Christians coming together to meet with the police chief and saying, this is what we're seeing in our communities. And the Jews are talking for the Muslims, and the Muslims are like, wait, wait, but you see this at your... And then the people in power are like, wait, these people are friends? Mm. This this is not what I've been told. This is not... But that's Houston. That's Texas for you, right? People in power like to show that we're divided. But when we get together and have hummus together, it's whose hummus is better, (laughs) Right. Uh, it's whose barbecue is better. It's like, wow, this food is really spicy. I didn't know I could handle it. And then we have this whole conversation on spicy yeah. food. It's, 
it, we're, we're, it's not that we're the same. It's just that we're all human. Yes. We have different approaches to yeah. it. Yeah. We have different approaches to our humanity. Mm. We have different ways of looking at our humanity, but it doesn't mean that one is less than the other. But what's nice about those van rides and those bus rides to Austin or to City Hall in Houston when we're going to, to speak and testify, mm. it's that we're all doing it to make our neighborhoods better. Better. For our children. Yeah. For us all as Americans mm. to succeed. It's not, I'm a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew. We're neighbors. Yes. And we're in it together. Yeah. And that's such a great way of demonstrating the relationships that we've tried to curate and build over the years. Mm -hmm. Say, when we do something together too. That's great. I love it. I, I've been uh, really thinking about that word neighbor as it relates centrally to like, my faith as a Christian, that I don't think that there can be any discipleship without neighborliness. Mm. I that's don't beautiful. think that you can, you can, you can put that uh, label on yourself and say, I'm following Christ into the world. If you don't, if you don't practice a deep, deep, a pervasive neighborliness. That's beautiful. You know, in, in Islam, so the, there's a common... Do you guys have an angel Gabriel in your faith? Yeah. Just, <laughs> come on. <laughs> he, was a, he was definitely a main actor. He was part of yeah. the main lineup in Islam we as well. My, my, right? my youngest son, Gabriel. Oh, is that right? That, yeah. So, yeah. So Gabriel would come to the Prophet Muhammad uh. and he'd come to him and deliver uh, revelation to him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a few ways that the Prophet Muhammad would receive revelation. Um, once it was directly in person, face to face, if you will, with God, and that was a commandment of prayer. It's the only commandment in Islam that was given face to face with God. It was prayer. The, and the other way is through dreams, and the other way is directly through uh, revelation through the angel Gabriel as an intermediary. And so the Prophet Muhammad told his companions that I keep getting revelation about neighbors. I'm thinking that neighbors will be included in inheritance as well, right? As part of the inheritance, yeah. like that's the right of neighbors over you, right? So there's so many there, there's so many points regarding neighbors in Islam that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him thought that they would have to be included in your inheritance as well. That's beautiful, right? So in the Christian tradition, crazy Paul. Uh, is talking to this woman <clears throat> who has married an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And Paul basically says in so many words, because of her, his connection with you and this community, somehow he, he's caught up in this faith. Like, I don't quite understand all of that, mm -hmm. but there's a mystery of relationship and neighborliness and connection mm -hmm. to where the mechanism doesn't come through our brain, it comes through our social realities and relationships. And that our belonging, at the end of the day, I think, Christianity at its core is a system not of believing, but of belonging. Wow. And that we are best. We, we fulfill... Um, the, the words of our own prophet <laughs> mm -hmm. when we are creating systems of belonging and we somehow create avenues that are what the New Testament might say anti-Christ when we create systems of believing only and cut people off from belonging. And so I think a lot of Christianity in modernity is um, woefully... Inadequate so making the church, making sure that the church is welcoming to 100%. everyone. Yes, not just people who profess faith, but people yes. who don't profess faith. People who just need a place to go to. People who need to be nurtured. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is one one of the things that Jesus talked about was it, it's the it's the sick that need a doctor. Oh my God! Right. So what are you setting up? You know, clinics for, and then have all the shiny folks come together so you can what? You know, everybody kind of just, you know, polish all the That's instruments, right. you know, and talk about, you know, the past. Or do you say, no, let's get our hands dirty. Goodness. We're all sick. That We've you, all been there. And right? that's such a huge conversation in the American Muslim community. It's been for a while. It's, do we want fences around the mosque? Mm. It's so some would say we need it for security, insurance purposes, but it just stops people from coming. Yeah. It, you self-otherize yourself. You yeah. make yourself into an exclusive club. Yeah, yeah, right. Lifetime has a fence. Yeah. LA Fitness has a fence. You know, these places have a fence. Sam's Warehouse has sort of a fence. Yeah, it does. They're not 
And I mean, that fence is the guy who's checking your membership, mm -hmm. right? So we don't want anyone to, anyone should be able to come in and be uh -huh. welcome. We have to create more clinics at our churches and our mosques, at our synagogues. We have to create centers for voting. You know, these polling locations yeah. have to be at our faith centers too. Yes, yeah, I, I just, 100%. I just really think it's because uh -huh. we have a tendency of otherizing, but when you walk into a church for the first time ever and you're like, Wait, no one's trying to convert me? Or a synagogue <laughs> and all of a sudden you you know, everything is okay and it's yeah. not as or especially a mosque. I remember when one of our mosques in Sugarland became a polling location, people's face when they'd walk in, it was a culturally cultural immersion experience. Like they were in one of those Channel Eight PBC travel <laughs> tour guide, you know, those those yes. those videos. Yes. Like we're in a different foreign <laughs> land, right? You walk in and like, whoa. We're somewhere like this is Aladdin's territory yeah, or something. Yeah. Right? We're border crossing. Yeah, 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 yeah border crossing. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> it's a whole different cultural immersion. And then you just walk out and like, wait, wait, this is yeah. sort of just like us. <laughs> Can I ask you a couple of super ignorant questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ask, ask. So when you say um, the prophet's name and then you um, then say, Oh, peace be upon peace him. Peace be upon him. Tell me about that. What is that? Mnemonic. What? What is? So that's a that's a blessing that as Muslims that we give upon not just the Prophet Muhammad but upon all the prophets. These are the most noble people on the face of the planet. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus Christ, Moses, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Noah, Lot. Um, they were some of the most noble people. So as a form of charity, as a form of a good deed, um, we always praise them when we say their names. Okay. Okay. So then I'm cruising. Friday afternoon, mm. and I'm going by the mosque. Okay, and maybe I don't have a lot to do. Yeah, and I'm like, I mean, what? Ha like, okay, I'm, I'm a white dude. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I, I get super curious. Like, what's going on in there? Yeah, can I can I go? Absolutely. Well, we don't have a membership system. <laughs> Sweet. There's I'm no. Not. There's no. <laughs> you don't belong to one church. I mean, you don't belong to one mosque or another mosque. There's no card system. But if I Anyone show up walks in. as a, as a Christian, but and I want and and there to learn there to say you know it just like what what happens what do i do you just walk in you tell someone hey i'm i'm not muslim i just want to watch and we have people like that all the time okay now so you come to my church i'm going to get you to fill out some stuff and i'm going to spam you <laughs> but i'll walk <laughs> out with the i'll walk out with the gift bag okay though. all right, yes, right? You, will. you guys give gift oh, bags will. here i'll get you a gift bag i went to sure. easter services at a, at a church in cyprus and i walked out with a gift bag i was like i got a mug <laughs> I got a back scratcher. I got, back scratcher. I got some hand sanitizer, right? So, oh, yes. So it was a, it was a profitable uh, endeavor. Oh yes, yeah, that's yeah. good. So I've got my coffee mug at home with the giant cross on it, and yeah, that's awesome. You know. <laughs> so if I if so I go to a prayer and and I don't know what to do. It, it, do I like so? Like I dated a girl uh, in college. It was Catholic. Had no idea what to do either. But you kind of catch on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and, but nobody was like super judgy. It was just like, you could tell, I didn't know when to stand and sit and do it. Yeah. You know, is that same Generally thing? no one will care as, okay. as long as you just don't get in the way. <laughs> you, you just, you know, you don't go up to the pulpit and start, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. giving out your own message. <laughs> you just, you just hang out, you just hang out in the back while everyone, you just take off your shoes when you go in. Um, and you'll get the, everyone, everyone will get the gist of it. You know, you, people go in, they start taking off their shoes, they put it on a shoe rack, then they enter the oh. sanctuary. And uh, for people who aren't praying, they usually hang out in the back. There's chairs in the back. There's usually really nice lush carpet where you can sit down and, and just watch the services. And no one cares if you're not. Someone might say, hey, why aren't you praying? Do you need help? And you just tell them, hey, I'm not Muslim. I just want to watch. Okay. No one cares. Awesome. I mean, yeah, you know, there's no one stopping. For the most part, there's no one stopping. There might be mosques here and there, uh, but for the most yeah. part, I'd say 99%. Everyone would be like, whoa, that's pretty cool. We're, we're such a curious people. We love it when people ask us about Islam. We okay. love it when people want to observe us because sometimes, especially post 9-11, a lot of us are made to feel like we're some strange alien yeah. creature yeah. coming out of a cave yeah. or the desert. Yeah. Right, where you know I eat cheeseburgers for lunch and dinner, and I don't know about shawarmas and hummus and all that. I prefer cheeseburgers more than anything. But it's a, at, at, at a time we were felt made to feel that we're this alien in our own country, yes. in our own backyard. Yeah. So having the sense of 
oh, they want to learn about us? Great. Yeah. Yeah. I think fear does that to us is it it creates a story oh yeah and then we other people yes and, and then we generalize to the story and to the fear yeah right and i think that's where there's a woman named Brene brown that that, that says it's really hard to hate somebody close up oh my gosh absolutely right? and you start to anybody that that my parents have taught me to be careful of as i've gotten to know them i fall in love with them right i think oh wait like you said earlier, we have more in common. Yeah. There's something about, you know, our desire to grow in freedom, our children to grow in freedom, for yeah. us to somehow be neighbors and and not just at Harvey when you are trying to survive or I'm trying to survive, but maybe trying to thrive. Yeah. And maybe we're caught up in each other's thriving at the end of the day, not just survival. All right, and there's something else that, that makes a huge difference when you actually break bread with one another. You share a meal, a yeah. sandwich you know, chips and dip, have queso from Taco Cabana or yeah. Chewy's, and you're just sitting there and talking about whose queso is the best, and you're just having a great time, but you have a theological discussion as well, but what brought that together was the queso. Yeah. And um, it's something mm. about breaking bread in all of our traditions, but just as humans, yeah. right? I mean, throughout history, <clears throat> it's just, there's a, bread is always involved. It's a common it staple. Is. There's a story uh, in this season of um, the Christian community where um, actually the, the, the place that Jesus is recognized, like, like post-death, post mm -hmm. uh, is when he's, when he's breaking bread. Oh, wow. Like, they don't recognize him. Nothing's, you know, they can't, they, they feel later, oh, didn't you feel something? But they don't recognize him until, like, like he's having tacos. Like he's eating food. And so there's something about, I think, the mystery of sharing meal together where we, like, like the mystery of God's divinity and who we are and all that stuff shows up, you know? And I, I, there's something about that that I think is beautiful. Ah, it's beautiful. It's and, and then you have such a, a rich anchoring oh. in the food, whether you liked it or you didn't like yeah, it. Right. You got that, that, that memory serves as an anchor. Yeah. I mean, you remember the type of food that we had, yes. right? Yeah, it was a cultural immersive experience yeah. for you. Yeah, it was right. great. Um, okay, so it's, it's 10 years from now. Yeah. Minaret Foundation just kicking butt and taking names, just doing. Nice. Uh, well, yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, and you have been somehow given a magic wand, of some, so to speak, to kind of say, I'd like to change this in Houston. Um, and it would really help a lot of things. It might, you know, release some floodgates of goodness. Mm. Like, what, what, like, yeah, what would you do? What would you change? When is Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is in November. When's the Super Bowl? So Super Bowl is in January. And the last question I'll ask is, when is Easter? <laughs> Easter is a moving target, but it's in April. <laughs> when's, when's Diwali? Diwali. Diwali has got, I have no idea where, when Diwali is. When is the festival of Abraham in Islam? Eid no al-Adha. That needs to change. Okay. All of us. Uh, we, have, we should know when each other's celebrations or holidays uh, are. That allows us to continuously greet one another. That allows okay. us to continue to celebrate with one another. Right now we're in Passover, right? Last night yeah. was the first night of Seder. Yeah. Tonight's the second yeah. night of Seder, which traditionally people open up their homes, yes. right? We should be able to know how to greet a Jew. I think it's Chag Samiak. I'm totally butchering the Hebrew, right? <laughs> totally butchering the Hebrew. But how do you greet someone on Diwali or when's Vaisaki, right? For the Sikh community, we have so many, we have a rich Sikh community yes, here. We, we have a highway named after a fallen officer of Sikh origin, who is a Sikh, right? Really? Yeah, I didn't know that. HCSO deputy, Harris County Sheriff's Office deputy, yeah. right? He fell in the line of duty and we named the whole highway after him, mm. right? We should know when Vaisakhi is. So 10 years down the road, part of being a neighbor is not just knowing your birthday or, yeah. hey, you had just had a kid or you know what job you have, but one of the most meaningful days of the year for you. Mm. Holy Sunday, mm. Eid, Vaisakhi, Diwali, mm. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, because a lot of our, you know, 
when it when it comes to the when it comes to Easter week for you guys, I mean, you're on lockdown, you're celebrating, you're praying, you're grieving. The same thing with Christmas for a lot of our Catholic mm-hmm. friends, All Saints Day. Sometimes yeah. people don't even know that All Saints Day exists, and what a tragedy, right? right? All the Catholic churches are filled to the hilt uh, in Mass on on November first. Mm-hmm. Um, we should know these things about each other. Mm. This is important. It breaks down barriers and allows us to celebrate one another. I love it. Okay. Dude, you're a gift. Ah, thank you. Hey, hey, you gift. are too. This has been such an inspiration. Mm. I love hanging out. Mm. I love talking about faith. I love talking about how to make America better. Mm. I like talking about how we can make a better world for mm. our children through the lens of faith. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, two, two, maybe not last questions, but two questions. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want me to ask you? Or did you want to talk about that is like like juicy for you right now, or something that's like, oh, this is what you need to know? I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? What should we have talked about? What did we miss the mark on? We've got um, a lot of trauma in the world right now. Yeah, maybe can we talk? Uh, yeah. Maybe not about. Stop and trauma for all, but right now we're in a tension. Like I just think, you know, not just in the in the Middle East with the Palestinians uh, and and Israel, right? Um, but then we're seeing like we're seeing like folks kind of rise up and say, "Hey, there's something wrong, <laughs> right, happening in other places, you know, college campuses or you know, yeah, where those things are are uh, protests are taking place." And I think it's very important that we not lapse into um, either anti-Muslim um, tropes or uh, um, or anti-Semitic um, tropes, right? right. I, and I think there's ways of holding differences that say um, it needs to be different. Could we could we do this different? You know, how do we do that? And that's not just related to the IP conflict. Yeah, please. look at the political polarization please. that we have in our country yes. between Republicans. And- any polarizing issue mm. pushes us as humans to our comfort zones. And our comfort zones are usually those that validate our worldview, our perspectives, and make it easy to believe the way that we believe. Um, all Republicans, they just want to take women's rights away. They just want to ban homosexuality. Mm. They want to ban abortion completely because they hate women. All those Democrats just want pronouns everywhere and want to open up the borders and X, Y, Z. It's easy to generalize and paintbrush entire communities and thereby vilify them Mm. intentionally or unintentionally because it puts us in a safe zone. We know that we're the right ones. Mm. And if we're the right ones and they're the wrong ones, it creates a binary concept because we don't have to go out and wade into the murkiness of gray or trying to understand one another because that takes courage. Mm. That takes time. Yes. It takes compassion more than anything. The compassion to be able to surrender yourself to another perspective, another view, surrender your set of beliefs mm. to another view, another way of thinking, right? To finding oh. common ground, middle ground. And we're so lacking in that. Mm-hmm. I think everyone says that. We're so lacking in finding the middle ground. It's not even just arriving at the middle ground. We first have to have the courage to step out, understand that we need to find the middle ground. Then there's a, pro- then there's yeah. a part of finding the middle ground. Then there's arriving at it, ratifying it. There's so many steps that take us into the middle ground. But first mm-hmm. we have to say there's a problem. Mm. So it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's the issue of the border. It's the issue of abortion, of homosexuality, of voting patterns, voting rights, America's role in the world. We got to keep talking to one another. More importantly, we have to know that we have to talk to one another. Mm-hmm. That our way isn't the only way. There are multiple ways to arrive at the same destination. At the end of the day, I think I, I feel. If we're not talking to one another, we're allowing this problem to fester and brew and polarization will continue and polarization is evil. Yeah, that's absolutely. what that's what the devil wants. The yeah. devil wants to divide us. Yeah. You know, in Islam, there's a famous hadith, part of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where Satan has his throne over water and every day the demons come 
and he asked them for a report and he asked them, did you split a family? Did you split a family? And the ones, the demons that split families that cause uh, tribulation in families and cause families to split, those are the demons that are the highest status, highest reward, right? So what about our families here in our communities, our family of America, mm. splitting relationships up, breaking us apart, dividing us? Mm. That's, that's, that has to be a plan from the cursed one. A hundred percent. In fact, the, the name devil, Diablo, means the divider. Right. So the very energy of that name is division, right? And I, I, I think, I think that's the. Uh, I, it goes back to knowing your neighbor's name, right? Um, not they're a hungry person, or they're a Christian, or they're a Muslim, or they're a Jew, or a Palestinian, but knowing each other's name, right? And I began to wonder, in terms of my own just like faith and also just um, focus like these two words have been like, I, I really feel like that it's got to be hyper local. <laughs> like you and I yeah. have got to figure this out among us and our communities, not just Christians and Muslims. No, no, no. But Sharik and Matt Russell have to, right. we have to figure this out. Right. Right. Um, and then um, it's, it's got to be hyper relational and hyper local. <laughs> um and I think that's where the, the the larger networks get connected. I don't know. Yeah, we don't need to be talking to each other at a national level. We just got to be talking to neighbors. Yeah. That's what forges the common bond in our mm. communities. It's just mm. our neighborliness with one mm. another. And it's, it's not just the we have to figure it out. We have to try to figure it out, the trying, the act, the yeah. steps that we take to try to figure the steps that we take to figure it out. That's the most important part. Mm. That's the, that's the part that takes courage. Yeah. Cause once you start riding a bike, you, you know, you start pedaling, it's those first initial pedals or whatever. Yeah. That's yeah. the hardest. And yes. then keeping it going is yeah, so yeah. hard. But when you're going, it's like, yeah, yeah. it's great. Yeah. yeah. This is, this is wonderful. And I just don't want to stop. I just want to keep riding around the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. One of our uh, theologians, uh, a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that the that sin, the only sin, is walking away from the table. No oh, man, right? I wow. think okay. You know, wow. when you break communion with someone, you don't bear that person's name in your heart anymore. You you wash your hands of them and then other them. He says that's that's sin. Wow. Yeah, that's that beautiful. Means. So, um, any questions? I'm here to answer any questions uh, for uh, about Christians that you have, and I speak for all of Christendom. <laughs> so go ahead, Shark. I'm ready for it. Um, w- 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 can you guys stop meddling and stop messing up this Israeli-Palestinian issue, guys? Christian hey, Zionists really we're just, messing we're, things up. We're just here to help. <laughs> That's all we're doing. <laughs> You know, it's funny to me. If we, I don't know if we got to close this thing down, uh, but I could talk to you for hours. But it's it's funny to me to hear you talk about like the Muslim community because it's the same with the Christian community. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a freak show. You know, it depends on what you know. Somebody asked me one time, "Are you a Christian, Matt?" And I my response now is, "You tell me what you think a Christian is, <laughs> and I'll tell you if I'm that." <laughs> you know, because it's like who gets to bear witness to. Our faith is sometimes the the nuts, you know, the folks that are just like div- like the most divisive, you know. And I think about you know folks like you. Oh, please don't don't judge us by our most extreme cultures, you know, uh, the exportation of ideas and ideologies over love because it's uh it's not true. No, it's a travesty. Mm, yeah. 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 Thanks for being here. No, I'm so glad. It was a blessing to be here. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I'm Matt Russell. I'm Sharik Ghani. And this is Pod Have Mercy. <laughs> <laughs>